We caught none of it. Uh, <laughs> none of it at all. So, uh, you know what I, I want to first uh, ask you about, actually, is, is the table of elements. When you were creating that, uh, had you already got the, the periodic table in your mind as a model to kind of, let's for want of a better idea, kind of squeeze body language into or did or did it kind of evolve over time and did you kind of go wow this is kind of looking a bit like a periodic table like what what happened what how did it evolve so it uh, the reason i wanted to put everything on a single sheet is like when i was a kid i had uh these waterproof placemats my mom would put down and some of them had all the states some of them had countries and presidents and planets and all this stuff and uh i thought one evening, like, how could I fit all human behavior onto a, a placemat? Yeah, I love and it. so it came up as a lot of boxes. It was super boring. So I thought, you know, the best way to make people kind of instantly feel connected to it is to make it resemble that that table. Yeah, I think that's a good idea because certainly when I l- look at it, I mean, I, I loved I loved chemistry and, and science in general, especially biology. I was super into biology. Um, and yeah, I think for, for anybody who had an attraction to the periodic table and, and the rigidity of that and the structure of, of that, yeah, you kind of go, uh, you kind of go, okay, so it's possible, like it's possible to, to investigate a bit more clearly mm-hmm. body language and understand it a bit more clearly. And I got to say, you know, like, I'm really impressed, um, I'm always impressed with anybody who tries to come up with like a universal model, yeah. <laughs> tries to go, look, because it's so, it's so hard, especially with the complexity of human communication. And even just one, even this is just one aspect of it. This is just like nonverbal and you've gone, okay, let me try and create something that's, that, that has a universality yeah. about it. And, and my guess is, cause, cause you know, I've spent a lot of time trying to create simple universal models is what happens is, is you've got your theory and you've got your idea and then stuff comes in and it kind of breaks the model a little bit and you're like, oh, damn, like, yeah. how do I now get out of, yeah. get out of this? Can I just how forget I that bit? How do I out of this <laughs> you know, backpedal out of my theory? Yeah. I mean, did that happen with, with, with your creation of that or, or did stuff fit in quite well for you? It happened a lot. So when it started, it was me at almost midnight and each cell was a note card just laid out across the entire uh, living room floor. And they would compete. So I would eat to, to have a place on the behavioral table, it had to have a minimum of four academic research backed articles for every behavior. So then these two would compete for this place in line or this location. And I'd have to go into the research of each one of those to kind of figure out you know, where they would go and then what's the conflicting gesture that goes with it. Or, and, you know, it's, it's an attempt at a universal model. It's obviously not, but uh, it was closest I could get. Yeah. I mean, I think the beauty of it is, is, is uh, you're right. You know, all the time we're trying to get closer to what's accurate and closer to what's helpful. And, yeah. and, uh, you know, it's such a good, it's such a good example of, 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 of getting closer to what's accurate and getting closer to what's helpful. And I, I didn't know that, that, that you'd kind of had this kind of competition around signals, that they've got to win a place based on, on um, evidence. Uh, so so it's, it isn't just full of any old nonsense that you, <laughs> that, you can, <laughs> that you can find. Like, yeah, ram it in, any old nonsense. It's great that, that, that there was competition. For, for space on it. Yeah, so it was kind of like an, uh, a football bracket, you know, where the teams would compete and then it'd get smaller and smaller and smaller down to get one spot on the, on the table. It was, it was a lot of fun to put together, though. Yeah, I they, love it. Working and with that, you know, I did it on Excel, Microsoft Excel. Yeah. And it was, that was a nightmare. Just the formatting of each little box and stuff, because I'm not very good at it. Uh, right. So it's eventually I found a periodic table online in Excel and just after a year of trying to format this thing and paying people to try to format it, I just found right. one and just copied it. 
Right. Intro. That was great. Yeah, I think, I think great. I mean, when, when I first uh, came across uh, your work, you know, that was that and another moment I'll tell you about in a second. But uh, but that was really a moment for me where I went, oh, yeah, this guy is totally serious. Like nobody's put in this, <laughs> this, you know, effort alone. He's totally obsessed just based on obsessed. I don't care whether this is right or wrong. He's <laughs> He, he's gone for it. He's put yeah. in the, the <laughs> put work. it out. Yeah, <laughs> and, and he's published Thanks, it. Thanks, man. So now you know. <laughs> yeah, and I made it free. Yeah, I wanted yeah. it to be free. Yeah, I think that's that's uh, that's great. You know, there was another moment for me. I was I was when we were first introduced. Um, uh, your work wasn't hugely kind of publicized. You were still. Uh, uh, I think in the services at that at that was, point, and yes. and I think we met up when you were still uh, in the services. Um, is that what you call it in the services? Is that a uh, yeah active duty? Yeah, yeah, active duty. Okay, yeah. Um, and uh, and so I, you know, I did a little bit of of, of research, and I found a really interesting uh, video uh, of you. It looked to me like one of the first videos you'd ever put on YouTube. Which was you coming out of Colgate? Oh yeah, yeah, and saying, and and I'm not quite sure who you know what the group is that you were talking to, but basically you were going, you know, I've had a few days looking through some papers, and I've found some correspondence between Ericsson and a bunch of bunch of other people, and at that point I was like, okay, this is probably a fairly serious person. They've they've actually made the effort to go and try and find some letters. Uh, and other documents uh, from, you know, Ericsson to whoever. And, and, and what was really interesting is, is me going, oh, and, he, and he's actually seriously super excited by that. Yeah, <laughs> I was. Like a- it was a, such a cool trip, too. Yeah. I was yeah. able to get, I think it was 36 cubic feet of documents. <laughs> what I love is that you've measured it in feet. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else would go. There were X amount of pages, but you've decided to put it into cubic feet. <laughs> that was the library's doing. Oh, really? Was it? Okay. <laughs> That's the only reason I remember that. But man, that was such a cool trip, and that was I felt like a first time. You know, I kind of felt like a little investigator, like I was do- digging into a, a cold case, and that's why I did it. You know, it's just. It was worth the trip. It was a six-hour drive up there, and I had uh, had the library put everything to the side, and it was, it was fantastic. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. But I think it was at that point that I, you know, looking into you, and I was going, okay, here's somebody who is who is uh, a fellow obsessive in <laughs> in this in the, fascinated. You know, somebody who's fascinated by this. By yeah, this I, stuff. I felt the same way. I watched your TED talk long before we met. Yeah. And even before I knew that you lived in, in Toronto. Yeah. Or Toronto, as they say. Toronto. Up there. I, Toronto. I can't even say it properly. I still say Toronto. Yeah. And, and just watching your TED Talk, man, I, I, I felt like this guy is not like the other uh, body language experts you know, that we see on, uh, on Facebook and stuff that are doing analysis. And uh, looking you up and realizing that you come, most of your ideas came from an evolutionary perspective uh, is really what endeared me to all of your work. And because I think that's the basis that we should view everything uh, uh, that should underscore all of our, our discoveries. Yeah. I mean, certainly from my point of view, uh, the evolutionary psychology lens model just makes so much sense to me. And it makes sense to me uh, not only from an evidential perspective, you know, evidence point of view, but it's just helpful. And I think it's accurate. It's accurate and helpful. And, and so I try and look through that lens all the time, because for me, it, it, it um, precipitates, I guess, answers that can be put into uh, techniques and actions that get a result and get a result that works and it's really quick. I'm just all about the economics of it. It's like there's so much you could do. There's so, you know, you know, and and you and I have, have, and and actually, you know, I would say you more than me, um, have read through so much material on influence and persuasion. 
<laughs> I mean, so much. And there is so much you could do to nuance and get an, a little advantage here and a little advantage there. But, but once I've waded through all of that, I'm just like, okay, but what, what can I do that will be the least energy and get me the most result? Yeah. And can I just keep on doing that and teach that to people rather than, you know, the, the, the very kind of interesting to you and I, but probably not that useful to other people yeah. <laughs> kind, of, kind of detail out there. And that's one thing when I saw your uh, just describe your description of the truth plane, yeah. the the way that that works in my mind is that it works immediately because it is not triggering the exterior like the neocortex. We're triggering a brain that's tens of millions of years old. Yeah. And every once in a while, you get these people like, well, I don't I don't believe in this in uh, genetic memories. And I say, well, how were you born with facial expressions? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Like when, so, so how did you learn to shiver in the shower when it's cold? Like, where did you get that behavior? Did, you, did your mom? Did your dad? Did your brothers and sisters? Did, did, did they t teach you that? Or is, or is that a, a response that is encoded? And, and, and if it is, if you'll agree with that, then what else is similar? It's so could it true. be, you know, could it possibly be facial expressions? Could there possibly be other things? I mean, um, you know, because I, I basically say, look, we're all pretty much the same, pretty much two arms, two legs and a head in pretty much the same place. <laughs> yes, there's some anomalies out there, some brilliant anomalies out there. But but I don't care who you are and where you were born and, and you know, who you grew up with and what country or island. I'm looking at you. I'm going, you're pretty much just like me. Your GI tract is just like, oh, you're fighting gravity just like I am. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> you know, and so I'm looking at that and going, so what did we have to do when we are, when we are, evolved from from ground dwelling mammals to upright hominids like we, like why was that what was the advantage there what are the disadvantages and therefore how are we all working with that advantage and disadvantage and can we um intervene in that system to to influence and persuade i mean like you i was i've i've been obsessed with the idea of influence and persuasion and 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 where can we get in <laughs> and lever it with the most impact for the least amount of resource. You know, That's so we can I'm do saying. it again and again and again without running out of energy. And, and if we up. have a technique that works on this 10 million, 20 million year old brain, yeah. that brain is, is an automatic responder. And sure. most of this persuasion stuff, the sales techniques, all these corporate sales trainers are going out there to teach uh, these big overarching methods that only deal in the conscious brain. Right, for sure. And, yeah. and even then, people, people will say like, oh, I, I don't, those commercials don't influence me. You know, I make my own, <laughs> I make my own choices. Yeah, I love but that. But if we have a technique that's, that can make the brain respond from that 10 million year old perspective, then it's instant, it's applicable, and it's there's nothing else you need to do that's why i think authority like our response to somebody that our brain sees as an authority figure is automatic and every once in a while i'll teach a class and somebody goes well i don't i have a i have a problem with authority well, yeah, well, that's yeah, yeah your conscious mind you're like the, oh yeah the neocortex but thing. also here's what they're saying is i have a problem with authority oh interesting so authority authority matters to you then does it <laughs> <laughs> It's like, okay. It's just like when they say, because I get the same same thing. Uh, you know, no, this influence and persuasion thing doesn't work on me. doesn't work on me. I'm like, I, I, and I always say, yeah, that's right. Exactly. You're right. <laughs> and I nod my head and smile. And they nod their heads and smile back at me. <laughs> and I just think, yeah, you're already, it's already working. You've just, you just proved, I've just proved you wrong. <laughs> and I'll often go, look, you see, it doesn't work on, on, on this person here. See how they're nodding and smiling at the same time as me. It's and so it's just, true. And it's just, yeah, I think, you know, every time I teach a class, we'll have somebody like that. Somebody that says, oh, well, I, I, that's not me. Well, I'm in this class to learn about those other people. Which yes. is like every other human on earth except for me. 
Like I don't, I don't fall into these categories. Well, and I think I don't know what your experience of it is, but but I think when I was first looking around in this area of influence and persuasion, one of the most interesting ideas that I came across, I can't remember who it, it might have been Bandler, it might have been uh, Richard Bandler saying it, which was in order to be, in order to be able to influence and persuade, you must be influent, you must be able to be in, influenced and persuaded. Like you've, you've got to know really well what it's like for these techniques to work on you in order to then be able to play these techniques out on with other people. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's really, um, I think that's really interesting. So I try and keep myself really open to these ideas. Cause for me, if I guess for us, it's very easy to go into idea into situations going, yeah, I pretty much know, know all this stuff. So you won't be able to get me. It's very yeah. easy for us to be in that. Yeah, you'll yeah. never get me. And and I've got to go. No, no. That's that's. I, you, of course, you should be able to influence and persuade me. I've got to keep on being in, influenceable and persuadable in order to get really good at this. Yes, and it's, and be able to pass it on. It's a lot like anything. Same with martial arts. The military takes the same same approach to pepper spray. Right. We, you know, we have to get pepper sprayed, and we have to know what it feels like so we we can use it more effectively. I guess. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's like well, it worked on me. I, I guess it'll work on them. Yes, but and so much like, like I don't know if you're a hypnotherapist or not. Uh, so I I, I I looked around that work. I actually uh, wrote um, some uh, some scripts for for some quite popular. Hypnothera- uh, you know, hypnotherapists and entertainers. Really? Uh, so I know, so I know it, but I and 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 I have my way of working that within influence and persuasion. Uh, but I would never call myself a hypnotherapist. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I yeah, I just did a class with uh, Dr. Richard Nongard uh, okay. out in Tennessee. It's, it was his master hypnotherapy class, and it's so interesting to note that. It works. It's basically a human becoming a placebo for another human. Mm-hmm. And it's it's like 80% of that is confidence. So if someone influences me and it works on me, and then I'm doing that to somebody else, that confidence does play a major role. So that's probably another facet of that, like just that I get influenced and it helps me to kind of go forward and do it to somebody else. Yeah, you're right. So the, so the nearest, the nearest I, I get, and it's pretty close, is within one-to-one training that I do, where really, I mean, yes, there's passing on techniques uh, to people, and the training is usually about their their them being calm and assertive and having authority and being seen as a as a great leader or being able to sell sometimes, but it's mainly around around leadership and how they present themselves and how they present content. So really, you know, you might call it presentation skills is usually what they're coming around but really what i'm trying to um give them is the ability to influence and persuade themselves into a state of 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 real confidence that helps their audience that helps the people they're trying to lead and so um you know often i absolutely am using what we might call hypnotic effects in order to help them get there really quickly. So we don't have to spend months and months and months doing this. We can get there in five minutes time. And they go, God, that feels better. That feels better. It's like, yeah, you're really right. It does feel better. You know, what you said there, that really, you know, I'll use metaphor. I use many of the classics of, of hypnosis, you know, metaphors, um, uh, uh, reframings, you know, those kind of things. Uh, a lot of body language, a lot of acceptance of where they are, so that influence and persuasion, getting in into their way of thinking and then yeah. uh, shifting it. But one of the interesting, get back to authority, which I think is a really interesting area that you've really, uh, you know, put a stake in the ground uh, around, is one of the, the authority techniques that I use is the authority of money, the symbology of money, which is it's expensive. It's expensive. Does that make What's sense expensive? To you? Uh, the the sitting down in a room with me for an hour. Oh one yeah. On one, yeah. 
It's so because incredible. If it, because if it's not expensive, it's, it, it, then, well, will it work? If it's yeah. cheap. It's just, I mean, no, it's think really about, expensive. Think about, like, when somebody's browsing on Amazon for something that they want, and they see something that's extremely cheap. They they pass by. They're like, uh, that's only twelve uh, bucks. Got to be got to be something wrong with it. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep scrolling. I'm gonna find one that's more expensive. Same product, you know. Right, right. It's the same thing. Right, and maybe not understanding what's happening there is they want to sell you this one thing at at the cost price because you'll go on and buy another thing and add on to it. But yeah. but because the mind is going well, I've got a certain idea in my mind about a thing that would work and how much it would cost. That's how I'm going to tell whether it has authority or not. Yeah. How much, because that's, that's the only thing I've got to go on here. I've never had this product before or service or been with a person who does this thing with me. So all I've got is how much should it cost? And I've got an idea yeah. around that. And so, yeah, one of the things that, that I noticed really was um, within a certain bandwidth of, of, of therapy, you know, of, of, of effect, let's say, uh, the more you charged, the more attention they would pay and the better it would work. And the less you charged, well, they'd like, oh, no, I can't make the meeting. Actually, I'm going to cancel. <laughs> it's so true. And that's, that's the same with a lot of people. Even chiropractors uh, get better reviews on Yelp uh, when they charge more money. And massage therapists, people will say, oh, that was a fabulous massage. If it cost $2, the same massage was just okay. Right. It's true. So true. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so, so t tell me, so with this idea of authority, because I think it shows up in, diff in, in different people's ideas of influence and persuasion. I think it, it kind of shows up in different models, not necessarily called authority, uh, but it kind of sho shows up. But I think one of the things that you've done is to go authority this is kind of it i think i think you're saying like there's lots of stuff you could look at but if you were going to gamble and you were going to lay your money on anything you're going to lay your money on authority as being a brilliant lever for influence and persuasion so what caused you to 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 you know double down on on that if that's the right kind of metaphor sure uh just listen to this comparison here all right uh, one of the best uh, influencers that ever existed was Milton Erickson. Yeah. Uh, if you took a guy with all those techniques versus a random guy in a lab coat at Yale, this random guy in a lab coat can talk a stranger into murder right. in less than an hour. And it took some great hypnotherapists or some great psychotherapists years just to get someone to deal with uh, an eating disorder. Uh, so if, if that much profound change can happen in a human being to where they break apart uh, from every social and personal and uh, family value that they've ever possessed, they will break away from all of that in less than an hour. Uh, there's something, something there. And I think, you know, 10 million years ago or a million years ago, uh, we were little nomadic uh, yeah. tribes here. Yeah. and. If, if we broke apart from the leader, or we didn't listen to the leader, uh, at best case scenario, we'd kind of get outcast. Uh, worst case, we get outcast, we starve to death, and we don't have sex, and we don't mm -hmm. have babies, and our DNA just disappears. So, I mean, all of our ancestors were able to do that. No one that's listening to this right now has an ancestor that's a virgin. <laughs> right. None of us. Right. We all made it. So that, that ability to do that and that kind of natural inclination to obey somebody uh, when they trigger certain things uh, was healthy for us and good for us. But those same triggers were present in uh, the Milgram experiment where somebody shocked another person to death or, or thought they were doing so. Okay, so, so, so open up that... Like, I totally agree. I think it's, that's a really good... Um, Comparison, and it's a really interesting comparison there. So, um, open up that idea of authority for me a little bit. What are some of those elements that you think are most important to to building the 
image or or experience for somebody else of, of yeah. authority. This is somebody with authority. Look at them, hear them. You know, what are they saying? What are they doing? Or what? Are, or, or or what are the elements within that? Do you think? One second. I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. Just texting. <laughs> sorry, I had to shut that off. Yeah. So uh, that that person that has the authority or the, the brain that's kind of triggered by it is there's a few things that need to happen. So like if you've seen something like the, the bystander effect videos to where there's there's a person like uh, just laid out on uh, on the road and in a busy street. So they did one in uh, London at Liverpool Street Station and the, the, it's on YouTube but if you see something like that, we have that that's our social agreement that we make with total strangers silently not to help. Yeah. But for us to deviate from that, it would take an authority figure or some somebody that that kind of stood out. So a lot of that is appearance. So like uh, in another study, this guy in a blue jeans and T-shirt is walking across the street uh, when he's not supposed to, like when it says don't cross and they put the same guy in a suit and have him cross the street and then people follow. Him. So, I mean, we've got law breaking behavior just from a, a clothing. Yeah. And yeah. so that appearance of being fit and being healthy, being looking like an authority figure in your culture. So our, we grow up and we kind of have a little list in our head unconsciously that there's a few things that indicate somebody's an authority. And another one that's that's really important is that that confidence. And I don't mean that because so many people use that word uh, in, a, in different ways. That just means a, a total lack of reservation mm-hmm. in, in your behavior. And that confidence is is kind of paired with slow, deliberate movements. Because if you think of... Anything that the body does quickly is a fear response most yep. of the time. Do you agree? Yep. Yeah, certainly under stress and pressure. That, yes. So I think that's the, you know, that's the interesting context for me is um, we could get it in the right environment, fast movements uh, and rhythms uh, could be seen as, oh, it, it excited uh, because of a benefit out there, you know, fast fruit picker. <laughs> It's like, whoa, this stuff's super tasty, <laughs> you know. Um, but in a in a context of there's not enough resource, like now I'm super greedy and get off the fruit, <laughs> you know, that's mine. But you're right in 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 a context whereby um, I feel like I or I'm confident that I um, control a valuable resource. I will be slow and deliberate because I don't need to worry. Like I control this valuable resource. And so back to the, the one of those earlier points that you made, it, it, it's very much, it, it very much has a cultural context quite often. You know, the, 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 the images and the triggers that tell me you have, you control a valuable resource um, in one culture is not necessarily the, the, the image that I need to see in another culture. I often say to people, um, uh, four stars uh, on a on a um, on a marine uh, is not the same as four stars on a McDonald's employee. Yeah, it is four. <laughs> yeah, it's four stars. So don't treat them the same. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> but it's still four stars. So there's an example where the trigger, the the image in the wrong in a different context, will mean something else. Yeah. Uh, that is uh, very true. Yeah. Right. And, and to that extent, if you walk with your four stars uh, outside of of the culture of the Marine Corps, you may not get the same res- result. Somebody might go, get in line like everybody else, mate. Just get That's in so line. True. You're the same as everybody else here. You're not special. <laughs> you know? So, Very true. Sorry, I, di- I, di- I diverted there. But back on to... Um, but that's, that's... I mean, that's a good point about that uh, from the authority perspective. Uh, we used to have... Uh, I was, a, I was a chief in the military. Yeah. And uh, the chiefs eat in a separate area uh, from everybody else. And as you left this, this chief's dining area, they had a big sign on the wall. 
that said if you lost all of your rank today, uh, would your men still follow you? Uh, and that's that's true because I mean a lot of people confuse the leader with the person in charge, and they're totally they're totally sometimes not the same person. You know, I often say to people, look, it, we all know who has the brass plaque on their desk or on their door, but somebody else might be the leader. Yes. Somebody else, and that might, that may change. Um, uh, you know, I often say to people, well, what we, what we follow, and it's not, in, it's, it's not a universal, because uh, there's some other factors as well, but I often say, well, first of all, we follow the strongest, clearest signal in the room. So clarity of signal, re repetition, clarity, volume of signal will mean that you will have more followers because you are now followable. You can't be the leader if you can't be followed. If I don't know what you're doing, if I can't, if I can't mirror, uh, if I can't get theory of mind and mirror, then uh, you know I'll just go for another person who's giving a strong, clear signal. And so for me in the leadership space, I, I, I got all kinds of people who are trying to do better at being leaders. And they, they can be super smart uh, and have really great ideas, but nobody's following them. Nobody's following them because they're not followable. I'll tell you who they're following, so, some other person who hasn't, has no decent idea. <laughs> but it's simple. It's like, I get that. I get what they said. I get what they're doing. I get how they're feeling right now yeah you know there's some leaders that i end up working with and helping them with their nonverbal communication and, and even for me at, at my level of 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 expertise i will look into their face and i'll literally go i have no idea what you're thinking and feeling i have no idea i just don't know i don't know whether you love me or want to kill me or or <laughs> are indifferent to me like there's there's nothing going on right now that I can discern. And if that's happening for me, and I'm an expert in this area, think about what it's doing to all those other people out there. You know, and often they'll say, yeah, and often they'll say to me, I've had one client who was, who, who said to me, and again, nothing changed in their face or their body. And they went, and, and, and we had to investigate that a little bit. But he, he said, uh, he said, you know what? He said, Mark, that makes me very sad. <laughs> and I said, that's interesting that you say that because I can't tell if that's true or not. <laughs> yeah, I can't even I can't tell if you're tell, sad. I can't tell if that's, <laughs> if that's, if that's true or not. Uh, we went a little bit into, into the background and there were some very good reasons as to why uh, he was being ultimately hugely protective of the thoughts and the feelings that he was having and of course that that was helping him with with or had helped him yeah, just opening as, up you know in his life in the in the past but as a leader being trying to move move up the organization wasn't helping at all nobody trusted him uh he didn't have uh you're absolutely right he without the 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 plaque nobody would have followed him in fact they'd probably have him taken out they probably go now's our chance that guy's a liability that person's a risk you know and but it's sad that this. a lot of people can a lot of people can master it a lot of people can do that but we carry stuff from from our childhood into adulthood unconsciously and it affects our lives yeah yeah absolutely and and and, and back to that primitive brain area we're carrying stuff uh, which is, you know, from my view, 500 million years old. It's got, we've got some 500 million year old processes, simple, um, uh, let's call them algorithms or heuristics, simple, simple equations, whereby, uh, that, which save our life on a daily basis. We'd be dead without them, but they're, they're not helpful around some of the more complex human communications that we make in our modern complexity and i don't mean the modern complexity of having i don't know mobile devices and it's like the modern complexity of the last two hundred thousand years we've only had uh, let's let's maximize we've only had agriculture maybe for about 14 14 000 years so so we're only just dealing with with the brain's only just dealing with agriculture uh, let alone mobile devices it hasn't even got its head around you know that kind of 
that it's kind crypt, of stuff. And that's why, like, <clears throat> maybe in another 50 million years, we'll inherit language like we do facial expressions. Who knows? And right. be able to, to make sounds to, to communicate to another human yeah. from, from age one week old. Yeah, but that's uh, but that's that's why like that the the youngest part of our brain is what we think we're making our decisions with, and what we think is you know responsible for everything. But that's a baby. We're teaching a yeah. baby how to talk. And so we're so that's the authority and the and, and the primitive brain. So we know we know uh, there's some ideas of authority which are so, certainly in the social mammalian brain, which we got we you know we got trained in by our parents and our leaders and our culture right. and and um uh and and sometimes those change as we go to a university or we move cities or countries or go into um uh, a, a strong culture like the services or you know we, we have to learn these new signals like learn this signal or get the hell out or die <laughs> you know, yeah you, you know there's a, yeah um but 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 when you think about that primitive brain, that oldest part of the brain, what have you got some ideas of what you think it might be looking for in terms of this is all this is authority that that entity over there has authority I think it uh, I think we're constantly scanning, and when a person behaves in a way that they have had a massive amount of authority in their past, there's a few things that show up in behavior. And one of those is action without reservation. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that ability to connect to others is good for leadership, but leadership and authority are, are uh, different things. Yeah, yeah. So another one of those things is a person who is comfortable and shows no discomfort deviating from social norms or, or something that everyone else is currently doing in the moment. So hmm. the guy, the smoke alarm goes off. It's the first guy that stands up and helps everybody get out of the room or on the street in Liverpool. It's the guy that deviates from the crowd. And then if so, let's, let's go back to that Liverpool street <clears throat> example yeah. If we see someone kind of deviate from the crowd, it's going to get our attention. Yeah. 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 The next thing is going to be appearance. <clears throat> and if the guy, if we see him deviate from the crowd, it kind of gets our attention. They're walking towards the person that needs help, but we look at them and they look sick and also homeless. Yeah. Probably not going to follow. Them. Yeah. But if we, they deviate and they're, they're wearing a business suit. So they represent our culture's view of an authority figure, that's great. So we have movement and appearance. And next we have confidence. So if they're walking in a suit, they're walking towards the guy that needs help, but they're looking around for someone else to join them. Uh, they're looking around hesitantly for somebody to kind of join them in deviating to go help this guy that's laying down. So that would be the confidence piece, walking straight to it. And... The fourth piece is connection. So the guy's deviated from the crowd. He's wearing a suit. He's walking confidently towards the guy, but he's checking his phone. We have no idea whether or not he's even seen the guy laying down. He might be about to trip over the guy. Mm -hmm. And finally, all of that produces an internal feeling in us. And it gives us, it doesn't make us obey. It gives us permission. So a person who is in the business of, extreme persuasion or or this kind of authority usage is not in the business of persuasion they're in the business of permission so we're giving that person permission to behave in a different way than they they normally would hmm. that's great so here's what i've because why you why are we saying that i was trying to extrapolate in my mind through to some principles there in my mind around this so what comes across to me from what you're saying is there's something about the directness of the of the movement. So let's just say there's two. Let's just say there's two types of movement: direct and indirect. <laughs> you know, I, I, yeah. I've got a goal, and I either go directly and do it, or I go indirectly to do it. And yeah. indirectly might cause me to look hesitant, or it might cause me to look like I haven't made my mind up. 
which is probably yes. hesitant in the same. So, so, so for me, I extrapolate out what you said there, this idea of directness, because, because I could train somebody to do directness. I could say, hey, look, if you want to come across as the leader here, if you want to come across with authority, can you just be more direct about everything that you do? And you, know, you can do it in a really nice way. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Because a lot of people imagine be more direct and then it means I need to be an asshole or something. Right, like right. You know? <laughs> right, uh, right. But that's, it's so true that right. have less reservation in, in your actions and your words. Yeah, absolutely. So, and then before that, before that, what, what for me, what you seem to be saying was we're looking for who first breaks out of the normal pattern. So, so first of all, we've got a, we've got a, as, as somebody who's trying to have authority, project authority, we've got to understand what is the normal pattern. Because if we don't want to know what the normal pattern is or what the current pattern is generally, there's no way we can break out of it. Unless we can see the pattern, we can't do anything different. So it looks like followers are going, they're, they're, they're scanning the space going I, I, unconsciously. And their unconscious mind is going, okay, I've got the current pattern. And then something extreme enough, clear enough happens that their instinct goes, hang on, what's that? What's that? And it goes, keep your eye on that. That's, that's, that's different. Right. And then they might be going, hang on, and that's really direct. That's got an idea. That's, going, that's doing something. That knows what it's what it's out there for and it goes okay now now my guess is is once that happens you're going to get a lot of mirroring happening yes <laughs> because the instinct is going copy that find out what that is doing let's predict get a prediction on that one yes yeah get a prediction on that one man that's and great then, i love how you did that yeah and I like then how what you've seems summed that up. yeah what then seems to be happening is um the instinct is going, okay, g g let's get a take on the, the, the outer presentation that that entity has. And, 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 and you were putting it in the context of, you know, are they wearing a, are they wearing a suit? Yeah. You know, um, and obviously culture to culture, that's going to that's gonna change. So if I took it down to the primitive brain, I'm going to go, what do we need to see to, to, for the, our instinct to predict for sure that person controls important resource. They have power. You know, that, that stands out, that is direct, and that has power. Uh, and the suit I, would, would, would do that. A suit would do that. And it's the same that a, a white lab coat or a yes. police uniform would, would kind of do. Yeah. Well, you know, as I always say to people, there's a, there's a reason why, certainly in the UK, I think... Um, the crime of IPO, which is impersonating a police officer. I think it's like, you get a lot of years for that. You get convicted of that. That's a lot. You do a lot of time for that. And yeah, I think the reason is you do a lot of time is there's huge amounts of power. If you can put on a police uniform, you can get people to do all kinds of stuff. All, all, kinds, of, all kinds of stuff. They will just comply. And so the law is gone. If you ever find somebody doing that, Put them inside for a long time because yeah. that's really dangerous. Dude, when we get off this uh, this conversation here, you've got to look up Obeying a Man in Uniform. Right. It's one of the best. I don't know if you've seen it or not. I've not seen it, no. The video is narrated by Philip Zimbardo uh, from the Stanford Prison Experiment. He oh, narrates, okay. yeah, narrates yeah. the video. Yeah. And it's great. They have a guy in, in England dressed as a sort of to look like a cop he's in like a train conductor's uniform uh, no badge or anything and uh, he hands this massive stun gun to a random stranger and he says look i'm watching this guy he's a he's a bad guy uh if he does anything i've got to go get my walkie-talkie out of the car if he does anything silly i want you to i want you to zap his ass and take take him down and all these strangers just blindly grab this yeah and they would shock this guy yeah, it's incredible. You know, you know, this brings to mind, and this is kind of moving off what we're talking about here. But I'd like to run it, run it past you, because uh, I was I was talking to a um, a, uh, a group that I'm consulting with at the moment, and we were talking about storytelling, 
and 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 influence and persuasion techniques within storytelling and um and how they can pick up great stories from from others in their organization you know not, not everybody has a great story that will influence and persuade a customer or somebody trying to lead but it's often you know somebody who has a good story and what i was saying to them is, is saying i've seen a whole bunch of tests that that say that the story about somebody else has more power than your own story so so an example of that would be to go uh go um Look, here's a story about about my life and 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 the, you know some success that I've I've had. But if I go, oh, let me tell you this story about about my friend Chase and some success that he had. Yeah, there's better impact in that. Now, here's where it really gets extraordinary. The moment you go, let me tell you this story from my mate Chase because he met this guy on the street. And this guy said. And now you start telling the story. It has even more impact. Yeah. Now, that could be something about, about uh, what I'd understand, and maybe you understand as well, about nested loops, which is, which is you've now shifted people, you know, down a, a tunnel of, of into fantasy. And now their mind is way more open. You've shifted them a number of times. But I think it's also something about if Mark is willing to tell a story about his mate who met somebody in the street, it must be pretty good. Like, he can't be messing us around here. Sure. This yeah, must be pretty true. good data. Some good expectation. Anyway, what, what's your response to, to that? What do, you, what do you think of that? There is the, uh, are you familiar with the My Friend John technique? No, no, doesn't, 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 uh, I've not, if I am, I, I've not heard it called that. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's what, uh, Milton Erickson called it, my friend John. And he would use, instead of telling a story just about his friend or something, he would say his friend did something. Because if I tell you, if I'm telling you about me and I'm making eye contact with you, uh, your, the critical part of your brain is more on alert because I'm talking about us in this conversation. If I talk about somebody once removed, you're less critical of the story, more open to, you're more receptive. Uh, so if I kind of remove it a couple of times, it makes the brain automatically say, this isn't about us, it's a story about a, another person. So our critical factor is not uh, kind of scaled up. Right. It, it, it's say, uh, uh, the way I'd frame that is, it's potentially safer. It's safer yeah. for me to take in the information because it can't be critical of, of me or you. <laughs> or it can't be more, more important, it can't be critical of me. Uh, you know, we're now way outside of this interaction. Yeah. yeah. Here. I, I just think that stuff's fat because it's so counterintuitive. It's so counterintuitive to, to go a story about a story <laughs> will have more power than... <laughs> than the actual thing happening there and then. I love that. I, and that's just the reason that I assumed it worked. I'd never thought about having it uh, removed and being somewhat of a nested loop, which I think yeah. is great. Yeah, I mean, theater, uh, theater does that quite well. In some, in some theater pieces, they will do the play within a play. There'll be a moment where Hamlet has it. Suddenly, you know, in, in Hamlet, uh, a bunch of players come on and they do a story. Uh, now, obviously, the story is reflective of of things that are going on in the actual play, and both both uh, you know within the plot line and within the mindset of of the characters. Yeah. Um, but it, you know, it's a pretty extraordinary maneuver to make because you're 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 you know kind of dropping levels of 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 um, metaphor essentially and i think what's extraordinary is that does something extraordinary to the mind i've been um i'm reading this great well finished reading it and and just really exploring it now for myself great book by simon lancaster called you are not human subtitle how words kill take take a take a look at it uh i will and it's and it's basically about metaphor and how we use metaphor um actually in 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 many periods of history to be really quite damaging <laughs> to large groups you know it's how you get he would be saying metaphor is how you get groups of people to, to do 
awful things to other groups of of people. Wow. And what's interesting about what Did he, he says there... Did he use the Nazi example of the... Yes, he does. Yeah, the rats, he's, calling him rats. Absolutely. Rats, vermin, um, uh, virus. Um, wow. Yeah, absolutely. It goes in depth, um, in depth into that uh, and creates an, an interesting... You've got a great model, interesting hierarchy, which is you've got, you've got like uh, the unseen kind of... Uh, stuff that affects us, those viruses and, and, and unseen like demons. And so you demonize people. It's like they're evil. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. like it's because it's, cause the evil is intangible. It's nothing that we can say, well, get the evil up in front of us so we can see it. So I can't, if somebody says, well, they're evil, it's like difficult for me to check that out. <laughs> it's, it's like, yeah. well, how, do I, how do I measure that? How do I get that on display? And that's the base. Say, well, that's the that's the base. Like you, go, you can go right down to they're just evil, and then you've got well they're vermin, they're a virus, they're dogs. So you've got a hierarchy of animals. They're just cattle. <laughs> then Cheap. then oh below that actually you got you got you got plant life. So well, they're a vegetable. <laughs> there was a study of how uh, much easier it was to get a, a sample group to agree to somebody's life support being shut off if you if you use the metaphor of they're in a vegetative state rather than they're in a, a medical coma wow it's like both things are the same you just one call one of them a vegetable it's like because they're not even an animal anymore not even an animal anymore yeah, I'm, I'm going to get that book today. I'd say, I, honestly, it's 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 brilliant and it's an it's extraordinary. It's one of the best books that I've 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 read in a in a number of years. And I guess you're like me is that we try and get through a lot of stuff, and some stuff is is really exciting, and some stuff is like oh, okay, this is really exciting. Anyway, you and then he builds it, it up. It. Yeah, yeah, and he builds builds it up, and, and let's go to the top of the hierarchy, which is angels and gods and stars. So they're a star. So metaphor's in, interesting because, as he says quite rightly, it's, it's a trick on the brain. We're calling something something that it is not. And the brain just goes, okay. If I go, oh, you know, they're vermin, the brain goes, oh, all right, okay, yeah, they're the rats, yeah. <laughs> it, doesn't go, it doesn't go, hang on a moment. No, they are not. Lit literally, that is untrue. That is inaccurate. It just goes okay, because it goes. That was easy. That was that was simple. Yeah, I can take. That's that. easy. I can I can take that. They're a star. Yeah, okay. What what? They're actually a burning planet, uh, billions and billions of <laughs> of miles away. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> like, that so, is really so, cool. Yeah, I'm gonna get that so, book. So it's uh, and and I think there's some probably probably something fascinating around that the metaphor I don't know metaphors that we might use for authority as well because body language essentially is a, is a it's kind of a metaphor that we use in our daily lives to get a sense of well who is that person you know who is what is Ch who is Chase yeah. who is that okay well and the brain goes okay well judge him judge him based on his movement right now. And then when I judge you on the movement, my brain goes, oh, yeah, I got him. I got him. I got, we know what he is. We know we got one of those. <laughs> and now it knows yeah. how to perform around it's that. It's true. And, Very and true. And either, either you do something so radically different from that that I go, whoa, hang on. I got that one wrong. That's, that's, I, got, I totally got that wrong. Or you don't radically deviate enough from my prediction and even some of your subtle deviations from my prediction, I just don't see that because my radar isn't trying to see that. Yeah. <laughs> anymore. Anyway, I, I've, I've kind of that's, skewed, skewed off, but... <laughs> that's fascinating. We, we make that decision, that snap decision. And in, in your words, it would be predator, friend, yeah. or yeah. potential sexual partner. Yeah, yeah. And then we just look for those, those data points. And you, yeah. In your TED yeah. talk, you say that that you know we we say this guy's a potential predator, and your brain says, "Well, go back in there and search for all the information that could prove that he's a predator." Yeah. And I 
I I absolutely love that. Yeah, and if you can't find it, just make it up. Yeah, just, just make make that stuff. Just make shit up. Just make yeah. it up. Just. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah, and these are these are, um, yeah, just kind of pigeonholes boxes that that are. If we can get somebody into one of those boxes, uh, we now know what what to do. And for our benefit, not for not for their benefit. As I always say, the primitive brain isn't in it. My primitive brain is not in it for you. It's in it for me. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't care about you. Speaking of your TED talks, I got to tell yeah. you something. So I went to your TED Talk in here in Virginia Beach uh, yeah. two months ago, maybe. Yeah. Month of, yeah, something like that. Fabulous TED Talk. So for, any, for anybody that doesn't know you, this may be in my audience, uh, your TED Talk is about the truth plane, this, this open area here and kind of showing that your hands don't have any weapons and displaying this open behavior. I thought it was fascinating. I watched everybody in the room, and this is in, in Mark's TED Talk, was standing up, and Mark had them hands up, and then hands behind your back, and then then doing this. And it was a fascinating difference. So the a week after I, I went to your keynote, I was teaching a class in Houston, Texas. Yeah. And there were probably 40 people in the room. So it was an eight-hour class, and the whole class, I, I did this the entire time. It, it went really well. I got home that evening and uh, I poured myself a vodka tonic and I had muscle failure in my <laughs> biceps. <laughs> I couldn't pick it up. I had to move my elbow up first just to get the drink up. So I was like, this is all well and good for Mark to do this for an hour. Yeah, yeah. I'm not doing it for eight hours. Because <laughs> people often yeah. say to me, so, well, you, what, hang on, do, you, do, do you do this stuff all the time? It's like, no. Like, some, some things are more important than others. Like, like, we've got, you know, everybody's been pretty successful just with their body doing what the hell it likes. It's like, you don't need, you don't need these techniques of influence and persuasion or nonverbal communication or interrogation or what for, for, for your general... <laughs> For your general life, I, I would I would suggest. Yeah, um, it's not something you need you need at the parent teacher conference. Uh, right, next time <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. It's it's for those moments where you go, God, I need to make this. This is important, and I need to create less friction around this. I need to get this result easier or quicker or more consistently because if I don't there's a big problem for me and my my family my community my organization it's like this is this is big because at those points yeah because at those points I would go well, can you can you sustain the truth plane for 20 minutes they'd like oh you know if it's important they'll go yeah it's like great <laughs> you know you in your case because because you do these marathon trainings and my hat is off to you <laughs> If I owned a hat, my hat would be off to you <laughs> on that. It's like, but I, you know, I, I honestly couldn't sustain it for, you know, that level. My brain would, would fry as, as yours did. Even not after an hour uh, on, on stage, you know, I've been so focused on controlling my nonverbal communication and my verbal communication in order to influence and persuade that audience and and uh, you know and anybody i would i would say if you want to if you want something interesting to dissect in terms of the work of ericsson and influence and persuasion both verbal and nonverbal just go and take apart watch one of my keynotes and look at the text and you'll see l so much embedded instruction and and that i worked so hard on being able to do off the cuff and Which now is, is fabulous. yeah and i i just love that stuff because it just works so well it's just so extraordinary how well it works but it, but it's taken a lot of time to get good at that stuff as well as being able to sustain the nonverbal communication for for long enough clearly enough and after i come off my my brain's fried yeah i won't be able to no. drive a vehicle i'm done, done. it's like yeah. yeah i'm done i'm, I'm well, you don't fried. drive anyway I don't drive anyway. I can't drive for toffee. Uh, my, just my dyslexia is I can't do left and right. I can't do left and right. I can't take direction. Somebody goes, well, you know, go to the end of here and turn left. And then I'm like, this is a gamble. 
This, this is a, you're, 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 you're doing Russian roulette at the moment with the driver because we could end up anywhere. So I have, I have, uh, I consistently have have people who drive me around, and and uh, which means I get there because when I don't, even if I'm using a map and I'm walking somewhere, I end up all kinds of places. All kinds of places and wow. people, uh, yeah. And and I set out really early because I know if I didn't, I'd be super late. But I'll get to meetings that I've walked to, and I'm like, oh yeah. So I, I was walking here, and I saw this, and there was this, and they're like, how did you end up over there? <laughs> like, how did you find? <laughs> um, you know, there's been, been in, interesting. There's been some interesting points in my life where I've just ended up places that I shouldn't be. Found incredible people. <laughs> Wow. You go, well, where did you meet that person? Well, I was lost, and and I ended up in this situation, and and you know that's how it all worked out. <laughs> well, you did you did a lot of good with it. However bad it's affected your personal life, it's I think it's helped you out. Yeah, uh, for sure. And your job. Well, it got me obsessed because because reading was really hard for me, and writing super hard. Um, it, it got me obsessed with imagery got me obsessed with pictures and how pictures affect people i i, I learned to read reading uh asterix the gaul asterix and obelisk i don't know whether you know those goscini and sempi uh cartoon books about uh about the, the gauls um but uh that's how i learned to read from comic comic books really simple language from comic books um uh, yeah so so uh yeah just fascinated with with imagery Look, it's been great. It's uh, been fantastic. It's been awesome. Chat. I hope we'll, we'll, well, I know we'll, we'll, we'll do it again, you know, live. And, and maybe if people uh, enjoy listening to this stuff. Yeah. We'll maybe do this. Uh, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> do this, who knows? Do this again. Certainly, I, I, certainly there's nothing better for me. than to, I know. Uh, sit Next down time and, we do this, uh, and, you know, we have this kind of in the works for you, me, yeah. and a few other experts to uh, have a few bottles of wine and, sure. and film the whole dialogue. And I think that's going to sure. be really badass. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm, totally, I'm totally up for, for that. So I'm going to stop this recording now, but we'll...